My 35-year-old female stepson, who is 18 years old male, was arrested when he was 17 for a multitude of serious charges. He has been in jail for almost a year and a half. It is looking like he will spend the majority of his life in prison after he goes to trial. A little bit of background. My stepson stopped living with me and his father at around 12, 13 years old. He had a Disneyland mom, so he and his brother chose to stay with their mom. Dad and I fought it for a while, but eventually decided, after much counseling from friends and family, to leave them alone. They will come around eventually. Well, my stepson got into a lot of trouble and is now facing serious time in prison. I contacted his attorney with a letter followed by a contract of rules if we were to bail him out. It would cost us $25,000, non-refundable, plus a lien for $250,000 on our house. Son is begging over the phone to be bailed out, as it might be the last time to see family and friends and breathe some fresh air. The rules are lengthy and strict. He must stay at our home at all times. Ankle monitor will be put on him by the state with a curfew. He must go to work with his dad, Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and make a salary of $1.500 to be paid towards his bond, with $1.50 going to him per week. He must attend counseling, church, and any other college classes he would like to enroll in. He must not consume any illegal substances, and so on. The worst part of the contract that I wrote. I sent the contract to his attorney, and his response was, On behalf of my client, I do not appreciate you giving him hope, then failing to deliver based on arbitrary rules you imposed. Your contract, whether you intend it or not, says the following. I don't trust you, you have questionable judgment and character. I think you are a flight risk. I think you are a liar. I think you are dishonest. I think you are lazy. I think you are guilty as charged. It says a number of other negative things as well. You clearly have an abundance of reservations about your son. Perhaps instead of trying to make yourself feel better, you should just bow out. This I know about love, a love that sacrifices nothing, that costs nothing, that gives nothing, and that protects nothing, is worth nothing. I will tell you that you have given him an abundance of terms that are evidence that you do not believe in his defense nor him as a person. I am a father. I grew up poor, and I've been on my own since I was 17. This I know. If you are on my team, there are no conditions. There is only time spent with the one who you love. A gamble. Having children is a gamble that they come out a certain way. That's what true love is, a willingness to roll the dice no matter what. Take a good, long look in the mirror. Decide if you are an all-in or a conditional father. His mother will not bail him out. We have to take every single penny we have saved to come up with $25,000 plus a lien on our house that will be taken away if he runs. After I sent the contract to the attorney, I am questioning if we are jerks for making a contract and setting rules and boundaries while he is out on bond. Update. The attorney texted tonight to inform us that our offer was declined and the son does not accept the terms and conditions of our bond out agreement. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, your contract, whether you intended it or not, says the following. I don't trust you. You have questionable judgment and character. I think you are a flight risk. I think you are a liar. I think you are dishonest. I think you are lazy. I think you are guilty as charged. Well, yes, duh. Comment two, not the idiot. You are telling the judge that you understand the seriousness of these charges and aren't playing around. His lawyer, on the other hand, appears to be, and if this is the case, your stepson should spend more time in jail because it clearly is where he needs to be. Now, for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for all the comments and support on my last post. It's been a tough few days since I last updated you all. After our son declined the terms of our bond agreement, things took a turn for the worse. My husband and I had a long emotional discussion about what to do next. We ultimately decided that we couldn't just abandon our son, no matter how much he had hurt us in the past. We withdrew the $25,000 from our savings and put up the lien on our house, hoping that this act of faith would show our son how much we loved him. The day of his release was bittersweet. We picked him up from the jail and the tension in the car was clear. Our son barely spoke a word to us, just staring out the window with a hardened expression. When we got home, he immediately went to his old room and shut the door. I tried to talk to him, but he just brushed me off, saying he needed some time alone. Over the next few days, things didn't improve. 
Our son refused to go to work with his dad, saying he needed time to adjust to being out of jail. He also refused to attend counseling or church, claiming he didn't need anyone's help. I tried to be patient, remembering what the attorney had said about unconditional love, but it was hard seeing our son so distant and uncooperative. The breaking point came when I discovered that our son had been sneaking out at night, violating the terms of his ankle monitor. I confronted him about it, and he exploded in anger, saying that we were trying to control his life and that he didn't need our rules. The argument escalated, and before I knew it, he had stormed out of the house, ripping off his ankle monitor in the process. We called the police, but by the time they arrived, our son was long gone. We spent the next few hours driving around the neighborhood, searching for any sign of him, but it was like he had vanished into thin air. The police put out a warrant for his arrest, but we knew that it was unlikely they would find him. As the days passed with no word from our son, the gravity of the situation began to sink in. We had risked everything to give him a second chance, and he had thrown it all away. The $25,000 was gone, and we now had a lien on our house that we couldn't afford to pay off. My husband and I barely spoke to each other, both of us consumed by guilt and regret. Looking back, I realized that I made a terrible mistake in not setting clear boundaries with our son from the beginning. I had wanted so badly to believe that he had changed, that I had ignored all the warning signs. I remembered how, even as a young child, our son had always been impulsive and defiant, constantly testing the limits of our patience. His mother had enabled his behavior, never holding him accountable for his actions, and now we were paying the price. It's been three days since our son disappeared, and we still have no idea where he is. The police have told us to prepare for the worst, but I can't bring myself to give up hope. I keep thinking about all the happy memories we had as a family before everything went wrong. I know that deep down, our son is still the sweet, caring boy we raised, but I fear that we may have lost him forever. Thanks for reading and for all your support during this difficult time. I'll keep you updated if anything changes. Am I the idiot for refusing to let my ex's new spouse's kids use my address for a better school? The ex and I have been divorced for several years. After the divorce, I bought another house and she moved to a nearby city. The schools in my city are among the highest ranked schools in our state, and one of the high school is ranked in the top 20 in the country. The schools in her city are among the lowest ranked, with regular fights and even kids hitting teachers. After a year of the kids going to the schools in her city, we decided our kids should go to school here. When the ex has custody, she drops them off at my house in the mornings so they can take the bus to school. Then they stay at my house after school, eat dinner with me, and do their homework until she picks them up around eight. A couple of years ago, she married a guy who has sole custody of a couple of kids around the same ages as mine. His kids go to the schools in her city. The end of school is next week, and as she picked up the kids last night, she asked if I'd be willing to let them use my address so that the other kids can join mine. She said that there was a big fight this week at one of their schools, and at the beginning of the year, a video of one of the students beating a teacher made the news. Her idea is that she changes her address to mine, and we keep the same schedule with just added kids. I immediately refused since, one, I don't want the ex to have my address on her license, and two, I don't want to take care of kids I don't know for four or five hours a day. She thinks I'm being dramatic and putting those kids in danger. She also said that her kids are going to have less of an education where they are and be less prepared for college than ours. Am I wrong for not wanting responsibilities for random kids? Thank you all for reading and commenting. To answer some questions I read in your comments. One, at first she picked up the kids at eight because of her work schedule. When she remarried, she got another job with a different schedule, but still chose to keep the 8 p.m. time. And to be honest, I didn't say anything. I cherish every minute with my kids and I look forward every day to eating dinner and helping them with their homework. I would give my right arm to keep this schedule because it's heartbreaking to see them go each night during the ex's custody time. Two, I do pay child support, but like I said above, I don't wanna rock the boat. I see it as a small price to pay to be more involved with my kids. Three, our kids legally go to the schools in my city. I have shared custody and had to show legal documents and filled out a specific form regarding custody when I registered the kids. Four, I have less than 10 years until my youngest graduates high school. So unless the ex does something insane, 
I'm planning to keep my head down and not make any waves that could affect my time spent with my kids. I saw a comment made by an attorney, and I plan to keep all of the texts she's been sending me about this. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. None of this is your problem. Lying to schools about a fraudulent address can have legal consequences. Tell her if she wants their kids in a better school, then move to a better neighborhood with better schools. This will not play out well for you. One of the kids will innocently tell someone and then it's game over. Comment 2. Not the idiot. Those aren't your children. You don't need to take care of them. And your ex shouldn't change her address to yours so they can go to school. If she wants them to go there, she should move to your town and get her own address. Now for the update. Thank you for the update and for answering some of the questions from the comments. It's been a challenging few days since our last conversation. The day after I refused to let my ex use my address for her stepkids, she showed up at my house unannounced. She was visibly upset and started arguing with me right there on the front porch. She accused me of being selfish and not caring about the well-being of her stepkids. I tried to explain my reasons again, but she wouldn't listen. The argument got heated and I had to ask her to leave before the neighbors started wondering what was going on. The next day, I received a lengthy email from her. In it, she detailed how disappointed she was in me and how she thought I would be more understanding given our shared history. She brought up some old grievances from our marriage, things I thought we had moved past. It was clear that this issue with the schools had triggered something deeper for her. I took some time to reflect on her words. I realized that while I still stood by my decision, I could have handled the situation with more empathy. I sent her a reply, apologizing for my part in the argument and for not being more sensitive to her concerns. I explained that while I couldn't agree to her request, I was open to discussing other ways I could support her and her new family. To my surprise, she called me later that evening. We had a long, honest conversation about our co-parenting relationship and the challenges we both faced. She admitted that she had been feeling overwhelmed and that the school situation had been weighing heavily on her. I listened and offered my support, even if I couldn't give her exactly what she wanted. As we talked, I found myself thinking back to our early days as parents. I remembered how excited we were when our first child was born, how we stayed up late talking about all the things we wanted to teach them. Despite everything that had happened between us, I realized that we still shared that same love and dedication to our children. The conversation shifted something in both of us. We agreed to start communicating more openly and to make a greater effort to support each other as co-parents. We also decided to look into other options for her stepkids' education, such as tutoring or extracurricular programs that could supplement their learning. In the days since, things have been better. My ex has been more understanding of my position, and I've tried to be more proactive in offering my help where I can. Just yesterday, I sent her some information about a summer enrichment program that I thought her stepkids might benefit from. It's not a perfect solution, but it's a start. I know that co-parenting will always have its challenges, but I'm hopeful that we can continue to work together for the sake of all of our children. At the end of the day, that's what matters most. Thank you again for all of your advice and support. It means a lot to have a community to turn to during times like these. Am I the idiot for asking my husband to fix his own plate while I prepare for the Air Force? I'm 29-year-old female, leaving for the Air Force in August, and quit my job recently to prepare. My husband, 30-year-old male, works full-time and expects to do absolutely nothing and just relax when he gets home. I clean up around the house, cook his meals from scratch, do laundry, wash, fold, and put all clothes away, and take care of our dog, feeding, walking, etc., while he's at work, all of which are done or nearly done by the time he gets home. Lately, he's been saying I'm slacking and getting lazy on him because I asked him to fix his own plate the other night. I cooked and he wasn't ready to eat, so the food sat out for a while and I had packed it away and cleaned the kitchen. Once I came upstairs and got comfortable in bed, he was ready for his food. Then last night I got takeout and he asked me to pick up some cookies from Crumble for him, which I did. While on the phone with him driving home, I asked if he could feed the dog so I can go straight to fixing plates and he said he was busy watching videos on my laptop about graphic designing, although he has a business partner who does designs for him. I was a bit annoyed and said I was just asking for a little help, but never mind, I've got it. As I walked in the door, he was getting the dog bowl to mix the food. I boiled ground turkey for the dog earlier while he was at work to mix with his kibble. 
He told me he wasn't ready to eat yet, but his food was in the fridge, and I told him to let me know when he wants it. He didn't say anything, and warmed his food and ate later. When we were lying in bed that night, he asked me if I'm okay and if being a wife is overwhelming. He questioned if I understood the duties of being a wife, and tried to make me understand that he expects to just come home and relax after work. He doesn't mind walking the dog or taking out trash at night because it's dark out. But even those little things I asked are problematic because he's tired, and I have the time to do them. After talking to him, he apologized for calling me lazy. But I still feel bad about it because that's clearly how he feels because he said it more than once. I have no problem doing things for him, and I genuinely try to keep up with everything, and rarely ask him to make his own plate. I can literally count on one hand how many times I have in the two years we've been together. I just think it was unfair to say I'm lazy or question my capabilities as a wife because of those small things. I honestly feel a little resentment towards him about it now. Am I overreacting? Am I wrong lazy for expecting him to do little things from time to time? Now for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. When we were lying in bed that night, he asked me if I'm okay and if being a wife is overwhelming. He questioned whether I understood the duties of being a wife and tried to make me understand that he expects to just come home and relax after work. He doesn't mind walking the dog or taking out the trash at night because it's dark out. But even those little things I asked are problematic because he's tired and I have the time to do them. So when you go to the Air Force, are you still expected to perform wife duties while you were working? Did you also have to perform wife duties? You need a partner, not someone who treats you like a servant. Don't have kids with this guy either and double check your birth control. It seems like he likes having a servant far too much. Comment two, what? This is ridiculous. He has his food bought, prepared and left in the fridge and he can't get it onto a plate? Utterly absurd, this is a grown man. You clearly do a huge amount for him. You need to put a stop to organizing him now before things get worse and you're doing absolutely everything. You should not have to ask him to feed or walk the dog, put his own food on a plate, or do anything else after he arrives home. You work too during the day, and your free time is just as important as his. His comments were totally out of line. Now for the update. Hey everyone, it's been a week since my last post, and I wanted to give you all an update on what's been going on. First off, thanks for all the support and advice you gave me last time. So a few days after my last post, my husband and I had a big talk. I told him how his comments about me being lazy and questioning my abilities as a wife really hurt me. He apologized again and said he didn't mean to make me feel that way. We agreed that we both need to communicate better and be more understanding of each other's needs. The next day, I decided to surprise him by making his favorite meal for dinner. I spent hours in the kitchen, making sure everything was perfect. When he got home from work, I had the table set and candles lit. He was so surprised and grateful. We had a really nice dinner together and talked about our days. But then, something unexpected happened. My husband got a call from his mom. She was in the hospital and needed emergency surgery. We rushed to the hospital to be with her. It was a really scary time, but thankfully the surgery went well, and she's recovering now. Being at the hospital and seeing my mother-in-law so vulnerable really put things into perspective for both of us. We realized how short life is and how important it is to cherish the people we love. My husband apologized again for taking me for granted and promised to be more appreciative of all that I do. When we got home from the hospital, we had a long talk about our relationship. We opened up about some things from our pasts that we had never really discussed before. My husband told me about how his dad was never really around when he was growing up and how that affected him. I shared some of my own family struggles and how they shaped me. It was a really emotional conversation, but it brought us closer together. We both realized that we have some work to do on ourselves and our relationship, but we're committed to doing it together. Over the past few days, things have been a lot better between us. My husband has been helping out more around the house without me even asking. He's been more affectionate and appreciative too. I've been trying to be more patient and understanding of his needs as well. We still have our moments of frustration and miscommunication, but we're working on it. We've started doing little things for each other, like leaving love notes or surprising each other with small gifts. It's the little things that really make a difference. Looking back on everything that's happened, I realize that my husband and I both had some growing to do. 
We got married young and we're still figuring out how to be partners and support each other. It's not always easy, but it's worth it. I'm grateful for the wake-up call we got and for the opportunity to strengthen our relationship. I know we still have a long way to go, but I'm hopeful for our future together. Thanks again for all the support and advice. It really means a lot to me. If you like this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.